Good afternoon to all of our participants. I'm Christine Beer, Executive Director of Sharon Historical Society and Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to a virtual tour of our Steeples exhibition uh, titled Steeples of Litchfield County. For me, Steeples of Litchfield County has been an invitation to look more carefully at the architectural beauty in our region, as well as re reconsider uh, how people utilize architecture to reflect themselves and, and their communities. I hope during this challenging time and really during any time you might find such an invitation to be uh, interesting and enjoyable. Um, this virtual tour will utilize photography of Jeff Goldberg of Esto, no relation to Stephen M. Goldberg. Um, we're, we're grateful to have this photography to give you all a sense of the gallery spaces uh, to orient you to the patterns and language of the steeple stories and the path through the exhibition and to focus on the artwork and the historical photography which uh, comprise the exhibition. Your guides today are master draftsman and architect Stephen M. Goldberg. You'll find Stephen's work in the University of Pennsylvania Architectural Archives. Um, also with us is Alexander Ellis, our creative and energetic curator here at Sharon Historical Society and Museum. We'll take 45 minutes for the virtual tour and followed by 15 minutes for participants to ask questions and have discussion. Um, I will be uh, recording the 45 minute tour session. Uh, if uh, I could kindly ask that if it's convenient for you to mute your microphone during the tour, just to minimize background noise for us and then unmute yourself during the, the discussion period. Over to you, Stephen. Well, well, thanks, Christine. Uh, Alex, you want to put on the first slide? Yeah, so this is a, um, uh, a shot of the entrance uh, to the exhibit. Uh, there's a very large panel that um, uh, basically Christine uh, did, did somewhat of an introduction to, but um, I just uh, like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an architect and um, I uh, received my architectural education at the University of Pennsylvania School of Architecture in the mid 60s. Um, one of the great things about Penn at the time was their adherence to their uh, Beaux-Arts tradition of drawing excellence. Um, at that time, they also had uh, what I think uh, were three of the greatest uh, American draftsmen uh, of that era, all on the faculty, uh, gold medalist Lou Kahn and future gold medalist Romualdo Jurgola and Robert Venturi. And I was blessed to um, have Venturi and Jurgle as my studio critics for the three years that I was um, at Penn. And those two gentlemen really inspired their students to convey their um, architectural ideas through compelling drawings, not just quick conceptual sketches, but also very uh, elaborate uh, presentation drawings. Um, so by the time I graduated Penn, drawing was really part of my DNA. Um, I also was fortunate to uh, receive the Chandler, the Penn's uh, Chandler Travel uh, Grant, which was a um, stipend to spend a year abroad. And um, I chose um, uh, Rome uh, as my base of operations. Uh, what city in Europe has more churches to sketch than Rome? Um, but anyhow, I did manage to get out of Rome and, and uh, traveled all over Europe doing sketches of religious buildings in different countries. And the, um, sketchbooks that I produced along with my student work and work, um, design work at Mitchell Jurgola uh, for the last 50 years now reside in the University of Pennsylvania Architectural Archives under the Stephen Goldberg collection, along with the drawings of my mentors, uh, Romaldo Jurgola and Robert Venturi. Uh, fast forward to 1982, I purchased a lovely farmhouse, 1830s farmhouse in Sharon, and began to explore the area and came to realize that there were really many notable religious structures right in my own backyard. And um, I was actually particularly taken by the uh, beautiful uh, congregational uh, churches, these white um, federal, mostly federal style, style structures with great classical details, um, uh, their white on white purity in the winter and their magnificent steeples, um, adding an exclamation point to the uh, gently rolling Litch, Litchfield Hills. So I began to um, start sketching churches in Litchfield County and what I was looking for were churches that had a strong architectural presence, um, great sense of proportion and attention uh, to, uh, uh, to detail. And I was also fascinated by um, the uh, many varying relationships that the steeples of these churches had 
to their napes and porticos. And so I decided to organize this exhibit around um, these sort of uh, steeple uh, typologies. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. Um, Alex, if you want to take a, a move to the map, that would be great. So on the screen, you see a map that we produced. This is the map of Litchfield County. Um, it has 27 churches. Those are the circular dots that you see on the map. Um, these, are the, these are the churches that I sketched that are part of the exhibit. Um, 27 is an interesting number. Um, it's three cubed, and um, you'll see from the drawings I did that the Trinity is a very important design element um, in many of these churches. And, you know, in this era of social distancing, um, you know, certainly one thing you can do is either get in your get on your bike or get in your car and um, and go see these uh, churches because I've made it very easy for you. Uh, I think you can download this map, or I, I believe that the museum will have them available um, once uh, once it reopens. Um, uh, next slide. So Alex, uh, when Alex and I were putting the uh, exhibit together. Um, we sort of were thinking like, how did the single steeple church become the kind of normative church form in, um, you know, in, in early New England and, and, and Litchfield County? And Alex, um, being the great researcher he is, um, uh, uh, came up with a really interesting study that he's going to present to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Stephen. I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, as, as Stephen said, uh, as we were putting together the exhibition, one of the most kind of thought-provoking questions that came to mind was why this image of the single steeple church that's so entrenched in our imaginations of what a church is in the United States, uh, how this came to be the dominant form that, that one sees when they're driving around in Litchfield County. And uh, this historical narrative really begins in the year of 1666 with what is described by historical texts today as the Great London Fire of 1666, aptly named, uh, which, is a, which is this amazing fire that began in a bakery and, and quickly consumed the old city within the Roman walls of London. Uh, it is estimated that the fire destroyed over 13,000 houses, 87 parish churches, St. Paul's Cathedral, and most of the buildings of the city authorities of London. Uh, perhaps 70,000 of the 80,000 inhabitants' homes were destroyed in the blaze, unfortunately. Now, the destruction that was wrought by this fire did, however, create a great opportunity for the gentleman whose portrait you see to your left um, on the slide here. Uh, this, this gentleman's name is Sir Christopher Wren, and he, he was an Oxford-educated scholar, scientist, and architect. And, and because this fire burnt 87 of the parish churches in the city, um, commissions for the rebuilding of these churches were sent out by the London city authorities and Wren subsequently, who was, was responsible for the designs of 52 of the 87 parish churches that had been destroyed. He was quite lucky and, and through personal connections was able to secure many of these commissions. Um, but what made Wren's work so important to us here in Connecticut was really the fact that his innovative combination of both the classical and Gothic elements in the ecclesiastical design of these new churches and particularly the inclusion of the single steeple form, which is a bit unusual. You think Notre Dame, some of these um, you know, extremely famous uh, churches of the continent in Britain. Um, and, and he carried this, this innovation forward as an architectural practice uh, through a second wave of British architects, uh, particularly Nicholas Hawksmoor and James Gibbs, who transformed many of Wren's 17th century architectural ideas into their own works and ultimately transfer them to the colonies. And so what you see here on this slide uh, is images of two of the precedent churches, which Stephen will talk to in, in more length uh, as we move through the presentation. Um, but this was kind of the beginning to the answer of, of why the churches uh, that we see in Litchfield County look the way that they do. So a second question uh, that was directly related to the history of these structures that Stephen and I had was where the ideas and designs for the churches came from outside of the, maybe the single steepled normative form, uh, perhaps the entire design and execution of these structures. And we were thinking to ourselves, well, it can't simply just be that Christopher Wren came up with some ideas and they made it to, uh, made it to Connecticut at some point. There must be more things going on. And so what you see before you is an in infographic that articulates the four bodies of knowledge that contributed to ecclesiastical architectural practice in Litchfield County. The first being related to the subject we just discussed, uh, general knowledge of the popular architectural movements of the day. Uh, this would be things, uh, terms such as neoclassicism or the English Baroque, uh, which came from Britain and the continent and was brought over through textual sources 
uh, such as uh, which you'll, you'll, you'll see later, uh, a text by James Gibbs himself uh, titled A Book of Architecture published in 1728. Um, and, and this idea just being the, the transmission of architectural ideas from the old world to the new. Um, the second body of knowledge deals with the individual's personal experiences. So this would look like the knowledge that one might have have of ecclesiastical architecture by physically seeing some of the great churches of Britain and the continent and trying to imitate some of these popular designs and styles. Perhaps even if one was involved with the actual construction or modification of one of these structures, it, it, it's this kind of knowledge. Uh, in, in many ways, this, this body of knowledge is one that might, uh, might have of the actual individual precedents um, that already existed in the field of study rather than the large architectural motifs associated with one movement or, or another. It was more focused on you know, the actual uh, structures that, that already existed rather than the ideas that informed the style of these structures. Now the third and fourth bodies of knowledge that are in this matrix uh, are likely the most influential of the four bodies of knowledge, at least this is my contention, and they have to do with the history of a regional New England ecclesiastical architectural style that, that first begins really in the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, and, and the earliest colonies in, in New England and later develops uh, to the Connecticut Colony. And really what I mean by this is the precedent set by the building of the earliest churches in New England. Uh, elements from the meeting house, or you may hear the term old ship style of the 17th century, work to influence the design of these structures we see today in Litchfield County, which are, of course, mostly late 18th century or early 19th century structures. One must keep in mind that in the western part of Connecticut, settlement happened later in the state's history, Sharon, of course, being uh, incorporated only in 1739. And finally, the fourth body of knowledge, this local idiom, uh, deals uh, with I, what I believe to be the most important force in the driving the design of these structures, which was really the local availability of building materials, technical knowledge um, of the builders and, and architects who worked, uh, along, with, along with the aesthetic preference of the congregations. Uh, many of Stephen's illustrations demonstrate the mastery of the carpenters, stonemasons, and builders who construct these structures, and their skills combined with the budget set by the ecclesiastical society who generally manage the building projects demonstrates the compromise between what a congregation desired their church to look like and what was actually feasible for the building crew. In many ways, these structures exist as a physical embodiment of the congregation's identity, and their preference for one architectural style or material over another help congregations to express themselves and to differentiate themselves within these rural communities that oftentimes had multiple faiths all vying for the same body of congregants. Those are kind of the, the big four bodies of knowledge that really, really inform uh, what, what building practice looks like in, in Litchfield County, excuse me, ecclesiastical building practice. And, and, and the third and, and final uh, slide here before we get into the beautiful illustration. So the, the final question that Stephen and I felt was really important to answer was how the New England Meeting House evolved from its 17th century form to the, to the 19th century form, which we are so often left with today. And uh, I won't, I won't uh, go through each and every single point here, but I kind of want to just summarize the big ideas. And so the basic church form in Litchfield County transformed aesthetically over time and often reacted to and incorporated characteristics of the popular architectural movements of those centuries. By the early 19th century, as you see all the way on the, on the right, um, the church edifice no longer resembled the utilitarian meeting house, but rather stood as the embodiment of a uh, town's religious character and social status. The plain old ship style was gradually replaced by neoclassic Gothic revival and Georgian architectural elements that emphasize new decorative mechanisms such as the columns, uh, such as the use of columns, excuse me, in the Greek order, uh, perhaps a cupola or spire and varying levels of decoration across the entire structure, which you would not normally find uh, in the 17th century form uh, generally. As time went on, different religious communities modulated this churchly form uh, that was established in the 18th century um, in varying levels of complexity, particularly in the negotiation of their relationships uh, between the steep nave and portico, which Stephen will speak to in length in the following slides. All in all, these structures exist today as a compromise between local idiom and international ecclesiastical architectural practice and style, carefully attuned to the denominational and congregational preferences of the rural communities of Litchfield County as they themselves matured over time. One can see, even in the plainest of Litchfield County churches, the lasting influence of both Christopher Wren and his followers, and the stylistic debts that are owed to the early New England meeting houses. Though the abstract examples above show change in a linear format, it should be noted before I conclude that these structures and the process in which they assumed their distinct characteristics was not linear, and oftentimes broke with the neat chronology and conventions that I've outlined and presented here in this slide. There are no strict rules of thumb when it came to this historical process, and like the structures themselves, 
this process was quite dynamic and fluid. And uh, now back to Stephen for a walkthrough of the rest of the exhibition. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. Um, so this is the uh, entrance to the first gallery, and um, there's a large panel that, um, um, that you encounter when you first come in. And this is uh, sort of more of an orientation panel. It, um, uh, on the upper left, we talk about the church components, uh, a diagram that I did that shows what a steeple is and its relationship to the nave and what the portico is. Uh, there's also a drawing of what is called steeple components. And um, this particular drawing is more typical of a congregational steeple. It has four elements, a tower, a belfry, a lantern, and a spire. But not all steeples had all four of those elements. Some of them only had, had two. Um, you might also notice the uh, weather vane. Uh, again, this was very typ typical of, um, of congregational churches. And Alex and I think that that might have derived from the uh, meeting houses, which were located on the coastal areas um, that were frequented by sailors before they went off to sea. And so, you know, the weather vane was an important sort of uh, part of that architecture. Um, other uh, other uh, uh, steeples um, are topped by a cross instead. But um, any, I think it's, it's very interesting that the um, congregational churches have these kind of wonderful uh, steeples. Now on the bottom we have um, what's called steeple types, and this is what I uh, spoke to earlier. There's basically, I've organized the exhibit uh, according to six steeple typologies, and, and this has to do with the different relationships uh, that the steeple has to the uh, other components of the church. So there's side entry, there's roof crossing, and there's corner. These are the three that are least commonly found in, Le in Litchfield uh, County. Then there's what I call um, front entry, and then roof, and roof linking. And on the right, when I talk about roof linking, that is a steeple that, that locks together the nave and the portico. And this is only, interesting, interestingly, only found in congregational churches. Um, next slide, please. So here's the uh, first uh, uh, gallery that uh, you, you enter, and, and looking back north to where you came from um, is the uh, wall that has the precedence drawing. So let's move on to that. As, as Alex said, um, uh, you know, uh, Wren was, was sort of like the, um, uh, the, the forefather of, of all these, um, these, these, great, these great churches, and this is um, uh, St. Clement Danes, uh, church that he did. It's a great example of what I call a front entry steeple church. You can see the, end, the, the steeple is, is right smack in front of the, the uh, nave. It's, it's the first thing you see when you approach this, the church and the entrance, the major entrance is at the base of the, um, of the steeple. So it's the dominant element that, um, that you perceive when you approach a church. Uh, again, the steeple is a kind of a hybrid. It's, it's a more Gothic, whereas the body of the church is is again more classic, as, as Alex described, um, uh, Ren's sort of um, uh, aesthetic. Next slide. Okay, this is um, a wonderful church. This is St. Martin's in the Fields, and, and this is by James Gibbs, who was a disciple of Wren's. And this is a perfect example of what I call a roof, uh, roof steeple. And here, instead of the steeple being right smack in front of the nave, it's, it's basically sitting on top of the nave. And, um, what this does is it allows the architect to um, design this beautiful colonnaded portico. So uh, in this case, what you see when you enter the church is, is this sort of beautiful portico instead of a steeple. So it's just a different approach to um, uh, how, uh, you know, to the impact that the steeple had on the uh, way you perceive, you perceive the church. And of course, this church is more classically oriented. This is kind of almost like a, a Greek revival church. Um, uh, next. And then lastly, uh, this uh, wonderful uh, example of what's called English Baroque. Uh, it's done by Nicholas Hoxmore. It's a uh, Christ Church uh, Spital Fields. And um, it's a perfect example of a roof linking steeple because that uh, steeple, which is a rather massive, <laughs> unbelievably uh, powerful structure, straddles both the nave and the beautiful um, arched, arched portico. And so, um, you know, I've shown you what's interesting about these precedents. There are three uh, examples uh, of the most commonly found uh, typologies. The other thing that's interesting about these three churches is that they were all done in, uh, in stone. Uh, 
They were made out of Portland stone, which is a limestone that was quarried uh, on the Isle of Dorset. And um, of course, you know, during that period and before, um, Europe and England had uh, amazing stone carvers who could, uh, in effect, uh, you know, uh, create the details that you see in these drawings. In New England, however, uh, uh, wood was in, a, in great abundance here. Um, and so most of the churches that uh, you find in early New England are wooden structures. And also many of the uh, Yankee settlers that um, were here, there were, there were a good number of, of really skilled uh, woodworkers and craftspeople um, who could uh, work with this ma uh, malleable material wood to, um, to create steeples that I think are uh, architectural works of art in their own right. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a view, you're, you're in the second gallery looking um, to the east wall, the long wall of the first gallery that has the side entry, um, roof crossing and corner steeple uh, church sketches. This is the um, uh, side entry, the first side entry uh, church. It's um, Trinity Episcopal Church in Lime Rock. Um, the, it's, a, it's a Gothic style church and, and almost all the uh, Episcopal churches of the early ones were uh, Gothic style like this. So uh, it has beautiful stone body uh, with the uh, arched windows that you see and this kind of amazing roof. Uh, what I love about it is the uh, massing relationship of that open porch that um, then uh, abuts the uh, steeple that then uh, locks into the uh, into the nave. So when it, it's Trinity Episcopal Church, but the massing is also um, three elements that compose the Trinity. And if you'll notice the fact that the, the uh, steeple is on the side of the nave, the front, which is the element on the left, uh, the architect or uh, designer was able to uh, incorporate two beautiful arched windows with a large circular window above. Uh, next. Okay, this is um, uh, a, another very interesting uh, side entry uh, steeple church. It's United Methodist Church in, um, in Litchfield. And um, the, um, the thing that's interesting about, about this church is that it's a, um, uh, an excellent example of what we call Carpenter Gothic. And um, as I'd mentioned, you know, there were many skilled woodworkers um, in New England at the time. And uh, so clearly, uh, this, this church um, was executed by people that had these amazing skills. And um, so what you see, again, because of the side entry steeple, they've been able to do a magnificent job at the end of the nave, which is the element that you see from the road. And as you approach this church, there's this beautiful arched window that's flanked by two smaller arch um, uh, windows. And this sort of wonderful vertical um, uh, a combination of siding that sort of almost frames the, um, uh, the, the arch windows. Then moving over to the steeple on the left, um, you, uh, you have the, uh, the tower of the steeple with this large circular element and then a six-sided star that's uh, oriented vertically. Moving up, you have the belfry, which is divided into three parts, which again reflects the Trinity. And then uh, the four pinnacles that soar above the belfry and uh, and um, uh, uh, flank the, uh, the this beautiful spire. Uh, next slide, please. And then here's a, um, a one of a few examples of a corner steeple church that I found in Litchfield County, and this is um, a first congregational church in Kent. And again, um, congregational churches were mostly uh, you know federal style buildings. They were they were more neoclassically inspired, and this is a Gothic very much of a Gothic uh, uh, inspired church uh, with this wonderful corner steeple, very powerful element, um, quite tall. But putting it on the corner allowed this um, architect or builder to develop this wonderful facade with the kind of wonderful filigree detailing under the gable, uh, the beautiful uh, window that um, has this uh, arch and um, all this sort of great entrance detail. And then the counterpoint of the smaller tower on the left corner. So it's a very asymmetrical and picturesque uh, sort of, uh, you know, Gothic uh, structure. Next slide. Uh, in the same room now, as you look um, to the left, we are moving now into what we call the front entry steeple typology. So there's two churches that um, are featured here, uh, which uh, Jeff took beautiful photographs of. Next slide, please. Um, the first of which is uh, St. Uh, Andrew's Church Episcopal, again in Kent, 
Um, this is a great example of a front entry steeple church, Gothic style again, uh, with the Episcopal um, uh, denomination. Beautiful pointed arched windows, and at the base of the steeple is this absolutely lovely uh, wood entrance with sort of almost a clover-like element over the top. Rising above that is the belfry uh, and uh, the the uh, lantern as well as the, um, uh, the the spire. And this um, this particular steeple, I think, is more reminiscent of Northern European churches um, that that um, have these sort of sloping sloping bases, uh, but it's a very beautiful church. Next slide. This is, um, again, another uh, interesting example of a front entry steeple church, incredibly powerful verticality. Um, it's a Gothic style church, but it's a congregational church again um, in New Preston. And um, so the two, I've shown you two uh, congregational churches that are um, in, the, uh, in the Gothic style. And um, what's interesting about this particular steeple is at the, um, at the tower portion, you have the circular element. Um, rising above that is the belfry, and then uh, this beautiful eight-sided spire. One of the challenges that these architects faced, um, which was interesting, was how do you make the transition between a four-sided um, uh, belfry and an eight-sided spire? And this uh, builder or architect was very clever. He uh, built a platform out uh, from the top of the uh, the belfry that you can see with these sort of wonderful uh, cantilevered projections, and then was able to take the diagonal sides of the eight-sided spire and bring those beautifully down to the corners, the four corners of this platform. So he resolved this in a in a very lovely way, uh, uh, you know, quite interesting. Uh, next slide. Oh, Alex is going to talk about this great photograph that he uncovered um, on, on on New Preston. Yeah, so this this what you're seeing here is an is an 1870s landscape view um, of the village, and 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 this this landscape photograph demonstrates the importance of church edifices within rural communities um, across the county. Uh, the church building itself was usually a community funded project, uh, drawing resources from not only the congregation's ecclesiastical society, which I. I mentioned earlier was the, the individual uh, body responsible for managing the building project, but also through community funding drives and personal donations. Um, and, and this image of the new Preston Congregational Church is a good representation of how a church building was usually the largest, most impressive structure located in, in one of these communities. And it often served a multi-purpose role, um, oftentimes serving as a town meeting house, uh, of course, a place of worship, and a vertically significant landmark uh, that one might use to orient themselves while traveling. And I really love this photograph because it really, it really demonstrates, um, you know, the, the fact that they, they, there was a specific intent putting in, put into uh, building the church at the top of the hill. Um, uh, Steve, I don't know if you want to mention uh, another bit before we move on, but. No, well, I, I think, you know, this is what's so wonderful about this example, uh, this photograph that Alex found is that, these churches were a beacon to their community. And, um, you know, the thing that, that's wonderful about the steeple is that um, it, by virtue of elevating the bell, the sound carried further. So that was um, a wonderful thing. And then, you know, those that had a lantern, uh, because, you know, in New England, it gets dark pretty early uh, <laughs> during a good part of the year. Um, having that lantern, um, you know, uh, also acted as a beacon and of course being it that it was at the highest part of town um, probably everybody could see it when they were coming to church so you know it's it's just an absolutely spectacular photograph that uh, that sort of says it all about why these steeples were important so go ahead next slide okay so now we're um, uh, you know we're in the first room looking um, west uh, into the second gallery and and we're going to talk about our last front entry uh, steeple church. This is a United Methodist Church in uh, North Canaan. Uh, this is, a, again, what I'd call a hybrid uh, uh, type church. The, uh, the steeple has sort of mixes of Gothic, um, and, uh, but the, uh, the, the base is, is basically more, more classical. And um, uh, it's, it's got a great deal of vertical uh, verticality. And you'll probably ask, well, why? Why do you call this a front entry steeple church when, in fact, the entrance um, uh, is is off to the right as opposed to being below the steeple, which is what you see in most uh, of these churches? And Alex will talk about on the next slide. But 
Uh, moving over to the steeple, it's it's actually quite sophisticated. The this one only has the belfry and the uh, and the spire, but the belfry um, has these wonderful chamfered corners, um, scalloped at top and bottom that make the transition, uh, you know, to the roof structures above and below. And in this particular steeple, the way the architect or builder resolved the transition from four sides of the belfry to eight sides of the spire was to actually almost build a pyramidal structure above the belfry that uh, the corners of which sort of locked into the diagonal sides of the uh, of the spire. So this is a little different than the one um, that you saw in, uh, you know, in uh, New Preston, you know, which was more of a platform. This one um, is more elevated and more more vertical in its uh, its orientation. Also, the other thing I'd like to point out is these wonderful um, uh, diamond uh, striping patterns that are on the uh, spire. That um, again, an example of what I call carpenter gothic in the um, in this part of the church. Alex, you want to talk a little bit about this transition here? Absolutely. So uh, what you see here on your left is a image of the uh, of the church that was taken around 1900 and, and the church itself was built in 1868. And as you can see that the uh, the central door was shifted to the right uh, and that took place only five years after this photograph uh, was taken in 1905, which of course took uh, taking the place of the stained glass window that's depicted uh, in the illustration as as one notices um, this impressive rose window uh, was a was a a, a a product of the changing preferences of the uh, congregation that, that occurred over time. Um, this early 20th century shift uh, in one of the most, in most major architectural elements of the frontal facade of the edifice really kind of demonstrates the dynamic nature and fluidity of ecclesiastical architecture in our county and, and the fact that these buildings were and are fluid structures, that they do go under, uh, undergo change over time. Um, some of it uh, will, was intentional, as you see in this example, and some of it uh, maybe less intentional, as, as we'll see later in the presentation. Um, but uh, uh, that, that'll be up in just a moment, so uh, let's continue on. Alex, I just want to, can you go back? I just yep. want to point out in that that um, <laughs> Alex found this photograph. Honestly, I didn't see it, but the photographer took this shot from it must have been exactly the same angle that I did that I did my drawing because it's they're just so remarkably similar I, I sort of couldn't believe it when he showed me that uh, <laughs> that photograph <laughs> thank you Alex next slide okay so we're moving uh, deeper into the um, into the second gallery and um, on your left we're now segueing out of front entry steeples into what I call roof steeples and this um, is a photograph of the first roof steeple uh, church we're going to talk about. Next slide, please. This is, um, again, a congregational church um, in, uh, in New Milford. And this um, is a beautiful uh, example of, uh, you know, neoclassical uh, sort of Greek revival uh, church. Again, uh, it, it has, you know, all four components of the uh, sort of congregational steeple. Uh, you know, the base, the belfry, uh, in this case, uh, very typical of congregational steeples. It had an eight-sided lantern and, of course, the um, eight-sided spire with the absolutely beautiful weather grain. If you notice on the clock, uh, I finished this drawing at two o'clock. I, Whenever church had a clock, I would uh, sort of put the dials on the on the time that I finished it. But one of the things that I realized about this church is I was going through uh, the Gibbs's uh, uh, churches is, is that this was a, a almost a copy of uh, St. Martin's in the field. And it's, and it's a great uh, series of slides that Alex put together. I mean, you just look at the similarities. Um, uh, whoever designed this church, you know, clearly was aware of um, of the um, of the Gibbs church, and and Alex is going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Yeah, so, so uh, this transition right here, you can see to your left, now this is an engraving that is taken directly from, um, from James Gibbs' text, uh, 1728, or 1728, excuse me, book, a book of architecture. And, and you can see uh, in this, in this uh, image to your left, the similarities uh, and the idea that I was talking about in, in some of the earlier slides of the fact that many of the architects and builders who are working on these, these structures uh, in Litchfield County had access to Anglo sample texts. Um, and, and, you, and, and, and quite honestly, the, the, the comparison is, is really, really shocking when you, when you see them uh, next to each other. Uh, the designer of the New Milford Congregational Church must have been familiar with St. Martin's in the Fields, or at a minimum, seen the design through James Gibbs's books. Um, 
so I just think it's a really great opportunity to kind of see what these uh, what these uh, design books actually looked like. Um, and uh, and yeah, onward. Nice. Great slide. Okay, and then uh, moving over to the uh, west end of the first um, the second gallery. On the left, there's a panel that shows um, this absolutely, absolutely spectacular uh, uh, Carpenter Gothic Church. This is St. Bridges Catholic Church in uh, Sharon. And um, uh, this is a total tour de force. I just love the, um, uh, if you look at the gable of the nave um, and the sort of curved arch, pointed arch uh, woodwork that um, sort of captures the, um, uh, the gable of the uh, portico and then it has its own sort of amazing uh, curved wood um, arches with this sort of crazy element over the door. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a stunning structure. And the, uh, the entrance is also very beautiful on the left. The uh, uh, captured within that pointed arch is this beautiful circular element with uh, three large circles, again, uh, de de depicting the Trinity. But um, um, this was a church that I actually, actually uh, sketched on Christmas Day. And uh, it just happened to be one of those days that was probably in the 50s. And I'd always admired it. I, I always see it when I drive over the bridge. And, uh, and so uh, on that wonderful day, I had a chance to sketch it. Uh, next, please. And then uh, lastly, the last um, uh, roof steeple church is, um, again, uh, Trinity Episcopal Church in uh, Milton. And this is um, one of the few of the only uh, church, Episcopal churches that's not done in stone, at least stone base. It's an all wood structure. It's beautiful. It's a simple, simple structure, gorgeous um, stained glass windows. Um, uh, the uh, steeple is quite beautiful, very simple with the four pinnacles, um, again, flanking the spire. And it has this uh, outstanding uh, entrance uh, that you see on the left and I I love the uh, the two columns that flank the door that are tripartite with these uh, beautiful elongated uh, designs and uh, the door in itself is, is is just stunning so again as I mentioned earlier I mean they had some amazing craftspeople who you know uh, could could do this work and and um, it just really stands out in this particular church next Alex, you want to talk about this transition here? Yeah, as a, as a quick, uh, quick little little story in, uh, into demonstrating kind of uh, intentional and, and unintentional uh, changes to the structures. Uh, during the 1860s, the Trinity Episcopal Church congregation had become a little bit of a, a ashamed of its old-fashioned style church, and they did try to modernize it by making it look more gothic. Uh, and the original steeple was removed from the belfry and replaced by a balcony with four square corner turrets that you see to the left. Uh, later on in the history of, of the church, on a, fri on, on a, a dreadful pr Friday afternoon in July of 1887, a violent thunderstorm broke out and lightning uh, uh, struck the, the turrets in Belfry and set the church on fire. And of course, you know, as the, these structures were uh, likely the, the tallest structures in the communities, it's really no, uh, no uh, you know, it's, it's quite believable that this is, this is what has occurred. And uh, rain did put the fire out eventually, but the belfry had to be rebuilt. Uh, and this time it was, it was somewhat lower uh, than before. And, and this is kind of the story of, of how, uh, how a church structure might uh, undergo some unintentional uh, change to, to the way uh, that, it, that it appears. And, and there'll be one more shocking story to come of, of, uh, of the changes that, that have happened to, to these types <laughs> of structures. But in keeping with time, let us carry on. Okay, so we're moving uh, to the end of the second gallery, and we're also transitioning again from um, the roof steeples to roof linking steeples. And on the right, you see the first of, of these examples. Um, this is an absolutely beautiful church, first congregational church in, um, um, in Salisbury. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It has a, um, in the portico, it has a, a large scaled entrance. This is more of a ceremonial entrance that um, is probably used on very special holidays. Uh, and you can see the probably the entrances that are used most of the time are on either side. But above that, um, above that entrance is a beautiful Palladian window. And um, again, the Palladian window motif is perfect for, again, the Trinity because of the three components. And um, again, the um, uh, Palladian window is, is repeated at the uh, tower at the tower of the steeple. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about both the portico and the nave, if you look at the corners, um, these, they're sort of larger scale 
staggered um, elements that are called coins. And um, these <laughs> are done in wood, but they were, um, uh, you know, harken back to some of the um, uh, Roman uh, palazzi that, uh, that had similar uh, detailing at their, at their corners. Um, the other thing that's quite wonderful about this church is the uh, cupola. This is, um, again, the only cupola um, uh, steeple that, that I sketched in, uh, in Litchfield County. And um, one of the things that's, that's, that's wonderful about this cupola is that it double functions as both a belfry and a lantern. Um, I don't know if you've ever driven through um, Salisbury in the evening, um, you know, during a, a uh, you know, when it's when it's getting dark, but they've actually uh, done this beautiful lighting of the ceiling of the uh, of the cupola. So it's 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 uh, it, it really acts as a beacon. You can see it from great distances. And um, again, it's talked about taught by this very interesting structure. In this case, um, uh, this absolutely lovely whale that uh, mm -hmm. uh, is is the uh, is the weather vane. Alex, you might want to talk about the next slide, which I think is really really great in terms of how this church came about, the design of it. So, so much like uh, James Gibbs's book of architecture in which some of these designs were drawn from, one of the other uh, topics that we discussed briefly was the idea of this New England architectural style, the local regional style that gets transmitted. What you see to your right here is an earthenware platter. It's out of the Winterthur Museum's collection. Um, and, and this is uh, the, the image of the church here is, is actually from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and the architect Charles Pittsfield uh, you know, designed this church between the period of 1789 and 1793. And this church was a prototype for the regional style that developed in Massachusetts and eventually made its way to here to, in Connecticut. And, and uh, here it appears, of course, on an English export ceramics. But you can just see the, the, the similarities between what we have here in Salisbury, the first congregational church, and the church uh, that was built in the uh, late uh, 18th century. Um, and um, yeah, so it's really, it's, it's quite stunning. It's quite stunning. Great. And then um, here's a, a drawing of that beautiful um, uh, ceremonial entrance that I spoke about earlier. I mean, it's a masterpiece of, of classical design with the fluted columns, uh, triglyphs and metopes over the entrance, and then um, uh, the, uh, the gable uh, with these uh, beautiful dentils. Um, so it's uh, whoever did this, uh, you know, obviously uh, had looked at the history books and, and done a great job in replicating these beautiful details. Next. So here we are in the uh, last, uh, the last uh, room of the, of the show, this beautiful gallery space. And again, we're finishing up with the roof linking uh, uh, steeple designs. And the next slide is um, the uh, first congregational church in, um, in Litchfield. This is just an extraordinary church. Again, beautiful colonnaded portico. And, and I think one of the best uh, steeples in, in Litchfield County. Um, Looks to me like I finished this one in around uh, 1225, but um, again, you, you sort of, uh, this, this one is really quite sophisticated because the belfry is eight-sided as well as the lantern eight-sided. Many times the belfry uh, was only four-sided, um, as you saw in some of the earlier drawings, um, but beautiful, open, detailed structure. And also what's, what's um, quite unique about this, this particular steeple is that it has a conical, um, uh, uh, spire and um, I think this congregation must have had a little more money uh, than some of the others because this clearly had to be you know a more expensive way to do um, a spire but it's um, it's it's really really quite beautiful next okay and here we are another first the uh, first congregational church this is in Harwinton um, this is a little different the um, portico instead of being colonnaded is um, is, is more solid with the three entrances in, you know, at the base and again signifying the Trinity. In many of these churches, the middle entrance was always a bit larger. Um, and above that, you have the Palladian window. Um, and then of course, at the uh, tower of the steeple, the Palladian window repeats itself. And um, you can see both in the tower and the portico and the nave, again, the uh, coin design uh, at the corners that was you know, picked up in, in many of these churches. I think, again, as Alex said, I think people sort of would see it in one church and say, yeah, let's, let's do it in ours. But um, the spire is, is actually a little bit um, sort of out of character with the rest of the church. And 
and Alex is going to explain. I mean, it's very nice, but Alex is going to explain mm -hmm. how that all happened. Right. So uh, thank you, Stephen. So the image to your right uh, is, is an image that depicts the, the church edifice, which was built in 1808. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the year of 1949, there was a fire that destroyed most of that original 1808 edifice. So again, another one of these unintentional events that has changed the configuration of the design. Uh, and to the right, you see uh, on this image, uh, the, the original bell being one of the only elements that was saved from the original edifice and when it, it had dropped to the ground during the course of the fire's burning. And after the 1949 fire, uh, the church was rebuilt at the same location. And uh, as you can see here, as Stephen mentioned, this, this, uh, this element here, it looks a little bit out of place, it's a bit gothic and it's more traditional style, federal style um, structure. And, and what actually happened was that a steeple from a Methodist church in Torrington, Connecticut, um, which, which was a, a, a assumed to be a leftover uh, after they had replaced, was actually attached. Uh, the Methodist congregation was moving to a new location. And so uh, they were, the, the folks in Harwoodson were quite lucky to be able to get, um, to, to get this part of the structure uh, and, and then placed on uh, after the fact. Uh, so a quick little interesting story about that. Um, moving on. Okay, and here we are um, back in Sharon. This is just a beautiful congregational church. Um, it's um, the only one, the only congregational church that I found that actually has a, um, a brick base. Um, and I think there's sort of a very powerful symbolism here between the red brick base and the beautiful white white steeple with the um, the brick signifying presence in the earthly realm and um, the steeple uh, signifying ascension to the heavenly realm. So with that, um, we are concluding the presentation. If you show the next slide, we wanted to thank um, trustees and the supporters of the uh, of the of the society and. Um, Again, as um, Christine mentioned, Jeff Goldberg, uh, he's an architectural photographer. I've worked with him for over 40 years. He has photographed every building I designed. And uh, we were just dumb lucky that, that I had him up here uh, before everything closed down and we were able to get these photographs because I think it really, um, you know, makes a difference to sort of see not only these drawings, but to see them in the context of the, uh, of the exhibit, and I think that these um, these photographs that Jeff did really are the next best best thing uh, to being there in person, which I hope you will be able to do in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for for uh, joining us today. The exhibition has been extended to July fourth, in the hopes that we'll be able to open um, our physical building. Um, in some way for access. And we are offering this same virtual tour next Saturday at the same time, four o'clock, May, May 23rd. If you know anybody that might be interested, please let them know. Um, and, and at this point, I think um, I'd just like to ask if anybody has questions or would like to make any comments or have a discussion on any of the points. Since there's a, a, if this is a small group, please just unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask, ask questions or make comments of our co-curators. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We live in Dallas and this is a good, uh, good reason to come back. We were focusing on genealogy, not churches when we were there. So maybe I can talk my husband into it. <laughs> It'd be nice to nice to see you here. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Great... Oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say it was a great job um, <clears throat> by both Stephen and and Elvis and of course you, Chris. Uh, I, hopefully, we can get it up on our our website because I think a lot of people would be very interested in in seeing it if they can't actually get to the to the exhibit. This is a, a, just a wonderful introduction to it. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Eileen. We will be um, posting the recording to the web through our website, and um, are also going to be posting the map. Uh, should anybody want to download it and make the tours themselves? Yeah. Any other last comments? Goodbye. Great. Well, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it.